So what, what I want to do is, so we, 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 we style this around uh, SOPA and PIPA, and we want to talk about what's next. But let's, let's dig into SOPA and its Senate counterpart, PIPA. Um, and just to remind everybody in the audience what these bills would have done. Very summary form. These are bills that would have provided very broad power to the Attorney General to obtain injunctions against so-called foreign infringing websites and serve notices imposing obligations on internet service providers and search engines to block access to these sites and uh, on payment providers and internet advertising providers to suspend financial transactions. They would have likewise created a mechanism for individual intellectual property owners to serve notices without any judicial involvement, um, identifying a site as one dedicated to the theft of U.S. property, at which point obligations would kick in for payment network providers and internet advertising providers. They'd have to suspend financial transactions with these sites, among other things. So you were one of the most vocal opponents of SOPA. <coughs> what were the biggest concerns that motivated that on your end? Well, you know, Tony, the, the concern was pretty easy to understand. I've seen laws that were tightly, very tightly written, and people still, very smart attorneys, like all of you are or will be, figured out a way to get into the cracks and the nuances and expand the law for their own benefit. This uh, SOPA and its counterpart, PIPA, in the, in the Senate, were very loosely written. They were great power increases. Certainly the right of, 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 of private action was, was at the core of a lot of this. And you looked and said, well, why is it so loose? The, the, the definition of the problem was pretty easy to understand. You have foreign pirates outside the reach of American law who then, in fact, get their revenue through advertising or direct transfers from entities that are in the US. OK, enjoying the foreign entity who you have no real control over, and then follow the money and cut off the money. SOAP and PIPA went well beyond that. They went into direct action against domestic companies. And in fact, what you saw was there'd be no effort under SOPA or PIPA to care about somebody in Moscow who's providing. As a matter of fact, in motion pictures, it only takes about 20 organizations to represent almost all the foreign piracy. This is big business. So it wasn't about 20 injunctions or about cut taking down advertising. It was about going after, if you will, uh, rack space located in Texas who is hosting people's product and some of those products in fact might include bootleg software and you wouldn't go after the individual who was simply renting uh, drive space you could go after rack space and force them to drive quote bootleg software off their site and I looked and said this is a fine possibility of, of laws but it's like 20 laws when in fact what we needed was one law which is why I authored open which would only have jurisdiction over those foreign entities. And I, I want to I get more into open as the alternative that's been proposed and, and still pending. But when, when, when SOPA came about in mid-October, um, PIPA had already passed in the Senate. And I think a lot of people out here were really quite surprised by the speed and the force which with SOPA started to move through the House. Um, showed up in mid-October, broad bipartisan support, backed by one of the most powerful lobbies on the Hill, got a committee hearing within, what, three weeks of introduction? Yep. And uh, everybody started to think, this is a freight train going downhill. Um, were you surprised that it moved that fast? No, actually, this was one of those bills. And, and on the Republican side, because Republicans control the House, my good friend, uh, uh, Lamar Smith, was guilty to a great extent of the same violation that we always accuse uh, uh, the speaker, the former speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, of. Basically, throwing a bill out and say, "Let's pass it, then we'll find out what's in it." This was a bill that was introduced at sort of the last possible moment. We, you know, we, you're over a year into, or almost a year into, a new Congress, and you didn't drop the bill until you're about ready to mark it up. Then you hold a hearing in which everybody. Is, is from the side that wants this bill passed, except one company, Google, who was ordered to come, not asked to come, ordered to come. And you look and say, well, that's not how we're hearing. Hearings are supposed to be about, we think we know what we want to do, let's find out if we're right. If you want to do that, then you have a panel that's for it, you have a panel that's against it, which is a little bit more typical, particularly for a bipartisan bill. And so, did I see it as a freight train? Yes, but I saw it as a freight train in which most of the people who had signed on to it didn't know what was in it either. And ultimately, that was its undoing, is people who had actually co-sponsored the legislation, uh, and uh, 
Dan Lundgren here in California, nearby district, was a good example. He had no idea that denial of, of service was in there, that in fact it could be a real threat to the stability and safety of the internet. Once he found out about that during the hearing and then subsequent markup, he flipped. He went off the bill, even though he was an original co-sponsor. So when you saw this bill show up with the support it had, um, what was the sense within Congress when it was introduced? Did, did it have the look of a done deal, or could you see the big fight brewing that we eventually saw? It had the look of a done deal. And, w and, and so as the, as the opposition started to grow through November, December, when did you first say to yourself, hey, uh, we can actually stop this thing. There's enough momentum. People have taken a look, dug a little deeper, figured it out. They see the warts. When, when did you first have the realization that it could go the other way? Until we won, I never knew we'd win. Actually defeating it, having it come, disappear off of any likelihood of being passed uh, before the end, before the election, was a, a pleasant surprise. What Jason Chaffetz uh, and Paulus uh, on the Democratic side, what we really sought to do during the markup, first the, first the hearing, but then the markup, was we sought to make this thing so radioactive that we could go to our leadership and say, don't bring it to the floor. We expected it to pass out of the judiciary. They had the votes. They had the votes with some to spare. But our goal was to make it so obvious that this was controversial that neither majority nor minority would want to bring it up and it would just languish throughout the rest of the Congress. Uh, because of Wikipedia, Google, and, and a host 7,000 various sites, uh, that delaying tactic that we had where we, we slowed up the amendment process to where they had to adjourn and come back to it weeks later gave us the opportunity for, if you will, the internet to come alive and change it from not just slow it down but stop it. So Jason Chaffetz and, and Paulus and a, and a group of us will take credit for slowing it down, but it was really the internet activism that stopped it. What do you think galvanized that popular backlash? Because there, there were lots of criticisms leveled at SOPA. Um, there was the DNS blocking. There were the, the injunctions against uh, search engines and service providers. There was the, the, the private mechanism where you didn't even need a judge to be involved to impose these obligations on payment providers. Was it a combination of these things, or is there one that stands out that you think <coughs> really galvanized the population around this issue? Well, I think what, what got people going was the denial of service, the actual DNS blocking, when they realized that people as high as the brother of the Secretary of Homeland Security was saying, this can't work, and if you try to use it, you will create literally holes in the internet that will increase piracy and cybersecurity will be affected. That got people to say, oh, this isn't such a well thought out thing. Who thought of these dumb things? Once you knew that th this was a potpourri of dumb things thought of by the Motion Picture Association behind closed doors in order to move their agenda, then you had, <clears throat> if you will, internet freedom become a question. People saying, well, what will this do to innovation? Oh. Well, then you start having Facebook and Google and every other, uh, if you will, company formed in the last 20 years saying, well, how would this have affected our original innovation? And it was pretty easy to understand. Every one of those 7,000 sites that somehow either went, went dark or put up a, a protest, every one of them in one way or the other would never have happened if there'd been a law like this to where the angel capitalists and the mezzanine financing would have said, well, we've got this risk. How do we, how do we mitigate it? And the answer is you wouldn't have been able to. This loose private right of action would have eliminated anybody from going up with anything where they might have, quote, been brought down by a, a lawsuit. So you, you saw through the <coughs> end of November leading into December, you, you, you sort of had the sense that there was a snowball rolling down the hill in terms of the opposition gaining mass. Um, and can you, there was, there was certainly the, the, the blackout that happened in January. Um, was that a signal event in the growth of this opposition that stands out in your mind? Were there others? No, it was the culmination. And, and actually it was a little post-culmination. Because by the time we had the blackout, we'd already had Eric Cantor, the, the number two in the House, the, literally the Republican leader who controls the floor, <clears throat> say that he was not going to bring SOPA to the floor. So once he had agreed not to bring SOPA to the floor because of the work that Jason Chaffetz and others did in the markup, he realized it was too radioactive. And more importantly, he started hearing, not from Hollywood, 
but from Silicon Valley. He was out here just a couple of days ago. He's a regular visitor. He's starting to hear just how bad this bill is in some committee that normally it's a pretty, judiciary is a pretty quiet, slow committee where things take a long time. Patent reform took us, you know, four con almost five Congresses to pass. So once he became aware of it and said he wouldn't bring it to the floor as long as this was this conflict, we had won. What was great about the blackout is the threat of it and then the actual event told 434 other members of Congress this was serious. This was the kind of thing that you don't want to do, is, is look at the innovation that comes out of our whole country and our whole world, but particularly out of about 25 mile radius of here, that this, would, this kind of legislation could shut off the innovation that has turned on a whole, a whole world. And was, was that message delivered most clearly by Silicon Valley or the grassroots reaction that you saw to SOAP? In other words, what I'm wondering is <coughs> when the members began to change their minds and the dominoes began to fall, was it because they had heard from Silicon Valley or was it because they had heard from however many millions of Americans? And, and that's a fair question, Tony, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be brutally honest. When we say 7,000, it was really seven or eight names that everyone recognized. And then they knew there were 6,993 more, and they went, wow, I don't know all those companies, but some of them have employees in my district, and all of them couldn't think this way in such a diverse area. The one thing about Silicon Valley is there's an opinion for everybody. That's why you have so many startup companies and so few succeed. And that, that's one of the in, in great things about innovation is, is it allows freedom to fail. Well, when 7,000 companies, some of whom you'll never know their name, others will become household words, and a few were already household words, get together and say, this would destroy our future. Microsoft, for example, sort of the, the well-established old-timer, they were just as animated, even though it might have been in their best interest to lock off uh, future innovation, because they're sort of the have. They, to a person, knew that what they had done would have been very questionable, particularly on the internet, Search engines. I mean, remember, one of the big attacks here of SOPA was just searching a site was going to be a violation of SOPA. Just providing a, 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 a for an input, providing an output that sends you to a pirate could have been a huge violation for which you would have had both the Attorney General and Justice and private right of action against you. Because one of the questions I think a lot of people have here and across the country is whether this backlash you saw against SOPA maps to other issues. And, and when people are wondering, so there's one story that says this was a popular uprising of the internet and all its users against a really bad bill. Another more cynical story says, actually, this was an uprising by Google and Facebook and a few other companies. And would it happen again if their ox wasn't being gored with a new bill? In other words, do the people have the power without the companies to make the difference we saw here? Well, I think the answer is no, they don't, but yes, they could. You know, social networking says that you can build a coalition of hundreds of thousands or millions of people in a relatively short period of time. So now the question is, and you know, we'll get to Madison hopefully uh, during this, one of the things that we're trying to change in Washington, but literally both in and out of government, is to get the, what we think of as the social networking into networking into government. You know, we. The other day, I, I looked at a brand new bill being dropped, and it was like 6,800 or something. Imagine there are 6,000 bills, and embedded in hundreds or thousands of them are not so benign things. If you can get the public as, as interested for every one of those bills that has something bad in it, there's 7,000 groups of people who can be activated against it so that it does less harm or doesn't happen at all. So let's, let's, let's get to open because I think that's a fantastic subject to talk about. But I want to figure out a little bit, as best we can, where the SOPA issue goes from here. Because just in the last few days, you heard Christopher Dodd say efforts are already underway to restart the engine. Um, and I think he and others have even said Hollywood is talking to Silicon Valley and maybe trying to figure out if there's some middle ground we can chart here some compromise we could make. So where is this going? Are those sorts of discussions underway? What are, the, what, are their, what are their likely destinations? Well, the White House has my phone number. It, it, it hasn't, there hasn't been any ringing. Uh, okay, maybe there is, but not on that subject. The, uh, 
no, look, I don't think there's a genuine outreach to the very groups who opposed SOPA and the very groups that supported it so they can begin talking about legislation. If there was, I think, open uh, or something like it is where, is where the legitimacy is. As I said kind of in the opening, you have foreign pirates. Nobody wants foreign pirates to profit off of stolen material. You have domestic entities who, through advertising or MasterCard Visa, direct fundraising, are providing them the revenue. None of those groups are standing behind some claim that they should be able to, to have those advertisers or provide it. So you look and say, any bill that says we're going to identify and give a reasonable but expedited trial, if you will, to these foreign entities if they choose to defend themselves, and then we're going to look at the domestic entities and say we demand your cooperation in cutting off the funding. That's, that's the element of a post-SOPA uh, legislation. It strips away the private right of action. It strips away the need for uh, the judiciary. And in the case of open, it looks at the ITC, which has been around for a very long time, as a, if you will, a legitimate form of protectionism. The ITC exists. Uh, and Code Alarm, by the way, you talked about it earlier, they tried to use the ITC against me and lost. Their patent was in, one of their patents was invalidated there. But the ITC exists to give very quick uh, six-month trials from start to finish so that you can, in fact, stop an, an importer in an expedited fashion. But right now, they don't have the right to stop the, if you will, the intangible import. If we give them IP as something that they would have jurisdiction over, they could apply the same techniques quickly to these pirates. So the point of open is to follow the money, and it's the ITC that's going to be the judicial body in well, that case. And, and Tony, I, you know, pride of authorship is really important, but it's not everything. It, the court we're talking about at the ITC, and I, and I commend everyone to, to just Google it, look at it, or you can Bing it, uh, and, uh, or Yahoo it. You know, I, I want to be very, you know, I want to be very careful here. The, uh, even if it's some search engines that no one uses, they are out there. Alta Vista. Uh, Alta Vista. <laughs> yeah. Well, just remember, I begin with SuperCalc. So, you know, for the, for those who have, who have ever used ancient, you know, he's laughing. You're not old enough to know SuperCalc. Your father told you about it, didn't he? Uh, but uh, the the fact is that the ITC is an administrative law court. I've told folks that are on the other side of the issue, I don't care where that administrative law court is set up. I don't care if it's uniquely a new administrative law court. But it's got to be, and, and Tony, you've got a background in this, a federal judge finishes a case, they really do not want to have continued jurisdiction. The, uh, Judge Green and the AT&T breakup is an exception. For the most part, they're not equipped and staffed to do it. Where when you look at an administrative law organization, where they're primarily staff driven, and the judges, to a certain extent, have to know, but at the end of the day, let's just say you have a, a Russian counterfeiter or, or, or a pirate, they may pop up 50 more times <coughs> under 50 more names. You don't want to have 50 more trials. So where a federal judge is not well equipped to have a staff that says, Your Honor, here's, the, here's, this, here's this entity, but you've already issued a judgment. This is the equivalent. We should be able to, to issue an injunction immediately against this group. That's what we're envisioning, is that once you've gone after a foreign entity, you shouldn't let them play the whack-a-mole game of disappearing and reappearing somewhere else and forcing you through a six-month trial. So long answer to say, I think it's an administrative law type of a situation. I don't care where that court is. So whether the tools lie with the judiciary or they lie with the, o the ITC under open. Which is, which is commerce for would, the ITC. Would, 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 so one question you could ask is, do we even need a new toolbox here? Because if you, you, know, if you, you talk about uh, foreign infringing sites like Mega Upload, well, apparently we have the tools we need to go shut down Mega Upload, grab Kim.com, and bring them to Virginia for trial. So do we need this new apparatus, however much it costs with, with whatever new rules we got to set up and figure out? Why do we need it? Well, I think your point is good. If you're going to deal with bureaucracy, see if you can find one that already fits. My view was the ITC already, it, the ITC already fit. It was already a bureaucracy, if you will, built to deal with exactly the problem. It's just they were used to dealing with Gucci bags and uh, an infringing, patent infringing product. Now they've been stretched over the years into, the, uh, into patent in general because they have injunctive relief 
or exclu exclusion authority, and that authority is under the eBay decision is essentially denied federal judges. So we're seeing the ITC actually expand it because they're a court of convenient jurisdiction for a lot of reasons, including an injunction. So do I view them as a, as a good one for this? Yes. And as a matter of fact, in the Open Act, what we're going to try to do is also reduce the amount of caseload by, by essentially taking back some of this well, you know, m many of you are familiar with the Apple cases, going the Kodak Apple case or the uh, Broadcom, uh, uh, Qualcomm cases. Here you have these multi-billion dollar U.S. companies suing in a court pretending that the other guy is an importer. And you go, well, no, it's an American company, pretty easy to reach. So Open also has an element of reform to try to reduce the unnecessary caseload of the ITC because every case that's in the ITC is also in an Article Three court. And that's, that's a waste of judicial time. So, so one knock on the tools that prosecutors have used so far uh, is, is some of the disasters we've seen with the domain seizures that ICE has undertaken. Right. I mean, you have them seizing uh, you know, dozens of domains at a time only to admit, oh, we shouldn't have done that, holding uh, DeJazz 1 for up to eight months uh, with no explanation of why they're doing it. There has been a real free speech problem with these domain seizures. And one knock on the ITC is precisely the point you raised, which is they're used to dealing with Gucci bags and maybe circuit boards and things like that. But what they're not used to dealing with is speech. Are they equipped to do that? Do we need new? Do we need to at least explore some protections, some free speech protections that are going to be built into the system to make sure that what's happened so far doesn't keep happening? Well, it's one of the reasons that the Open Act is on our Madison platform. People can go in and amend it. They can go in and make those kinds of comments and not just say we should do this, but tell us how you would do it. Give us the, the draft language, if you will, because generally when someone says draft language, somebody else says, well, you, hey, you haven't thought of this, and they further amend it. But to answer your question I, and I, in, a, in a fair way, for the most part, the answer is no, because for the most part, the ITC is dealing with patent and copyright infringement. And if we give them only the narrow authority to deal with, patent and copyright, in this case copyright, uh, where it's being sent through the internet because it's not DVDs arrive. Right now, if a DVD arrives, arrives at port of entry, the ITC already has jurisdiction. So the interesting thing is they're already dealing with movie piracy as long as it's a wad of DVDs. As soon as it's emailed to you, they, they're not dealing with it. So to a great extent, they know they have the expertise. The other thing is their tool is very narrow. They must get injunctive relief against a foreign entity. That's the only one they have rights for. And then their ability to get cooperation from a U.S. entity is based not only on the U.S. entity being able to say, I'm not guilty, but more importantly, when you take on, let's just say, a company in, in, in Russia, if they're really innocent, there'll be a pushback. Uh, our assumption is the ITC will do 20 cases, and fairly quickly, people will realize it's not that profitable. Uh, and which is one of the big questions is, why not do something that's very narrow? I'd be willing to have the bill only have three years before it has to go through reauthorization. Why? Because my view is keep it short so that you can't just have it go on making mistakes if it's making mistakes. So let's talk about open in Madison because that's a, a, a very unique approach to drafting legislation. So with the Open Act, I think it was the first one you did this with, you put it up on the web. Right. And you invited the public to come online and suggest changes and amendments to the bill, some of which made it into the proposed version, right? Yep. Um, what, are, what, are, what, are, what are some of them that made them in offhand, if you remember any? I don't, I, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. There were 40, 40 that had merit in one way or the other that uh, we found ways to, to fit in. Uh, but it's still online, and it's still a, it's still a working document. There's, uh, uh, there would be months or even years before that bill would become law. And that's one of the points we have. Now, Madison is, is a platform that is not universal yet. Our goal is to make it universal at the federal level, both for the legislature and then eventually uh, dealing with rulemaking authority. Right now, when you look at the FCC or any of these other rulemaking organizations, they put out, quote, their finished product, let you comment on it, then they put out their finished product again. And it's pretty obviously not a transparent system because they've already decided what they want to do and they put it out for, quote, public comment. We want to get to where the earliest draft ideas are out on the web 
the input is there before the initial rule and then a process where you can see what was changed, when it was changed, and whether or not there was public input. Our big reason is we want to have more public comment and we want that public comment to be seen by every American to know whether, quote, it was a real suggestion or something a bureaucrat just threw in because, quote, they wanted to look like they improved their, their law. Well, a lot of people are very cynical about who has input into the legislative process. Um, and part of their cynicism, I think, says, I'm not sure my representative or my senator actually wants to hear what I think. What has been the reception among your fellow uh, Congress people, and for that matter, the reception in the Senate to this idea, um, pretty radical, of opening them up, opening up, opening up legislation to the public to comment and change as part of the drafting process? Well, Tony, you have to understand some of the legislatures, or some, some of my, my companions in the House and the Senate, are still wondering why we have cameras on the House floor. Uh, <laughs> You know, last December, we went live for the entire Congress, just before the end of the year. Every hearing in Congress now is streamed uh, and recorded. Our, our committee did it starting in February of the year I took over as chairman because we thought it was important. By, by March or April, we had five years worth of historic tape, tape in being an old term, but digital, online. Uh, many of my, my friends fought that till the very last days, and then, then at the last day, they didn't want to be the one committee that wasn't online, so everybody got to be online. To a certain extent, this is one of those things where we're not going to see people run up and take their toughest bill and throw it out there for public ridicule, if you will, until it becomes the norm. And then it's, look, this is just part of the process. And it should be part of the process. If you, if you empower people, you get more buy-in. If you don't empower people, then why can't they be cynical and say, nobody asked me, I didn't have any input. I want to be able to say to everyone, every American had input. I didn't see you, you on the bill when it was being put before you. And unless you, you know, unless you were just out of the country for six months, you had a chance. I shouldn't say out of the country because you'd have chance anywhere. So let's talk about the opposite of open, ACTA. Um, You've been very critical of it, I think, as a matter of process and substance. Um, let's start with the process. It is the opposite of open, literally, negotiated in secret, no public right. input whatsoever. In fact, you know, the 38 people who got to see it as it was being put together literally had to sign who knows what, promising they wouldn't say a word about it. Um, why the closed doors, in your opinion? Because they wanted an end result. And, you know, normally the reason you close the doors uh, is that you need temporary candor. And temporary candor can be important. If I want a witness to come in, a whistleblower to come in, I want to tell them that if, if we decide not to do anything, their name will never be known. That's fine. That's the nature of whistleblowers is they're, they're only comfortable enough to come in and talk to you. They're not comfortable enough to be in front of a, a government hearing. And over time, they may or may not become comfortable. Well, in this case, these are basically secret process so they can get to the end result publish it, and then say, but you've got buy-in of all the nations, and six have already ratified it, and therefore it's binding on the U.S. Well, that's, that's making it a done deal from day one. And if ACTA had, had had to deal with what SOPA dealt with, it not only wouldn't be law in this country, it wouldn't be law in the other countries, because most of the countries, when, when reevaluating what they've gotten itself into, really aren't just sold on some of the principles as, they, as you would have had them think. Are you concerned about trade agreements becoming vehicles for intellectual property regulation in general, and especially on the internet? Because one criticism of that phenomenon is if you look at the, the, the arc of time, you see Bern followed by TRIPS, followed by ACTA, followed by the TPP. What you see is a greatly diminishing role for Congress in making these policy decisions. What do we do about that? Well, I think you, you hit a real good point. Trade authority belongs to the House of Representatives. I repeat, trade belongs to the House of Representatives. Confirmation of treaties belongs to the Senate. These techniques are bypassing both. And the reason the Founding Fathers had these provisions was basically the House of Commons, if you will, was assumed to be the most trustworthy to not trade away trade relations. Because you know you had the farmer, you had the uh, the stonemason, you had the uh, the square nail, uh, you know, fabricator, and they wanted them protected, and they chose to have them protected in 
U.S. House. So trade promotion authority is essentially signing away uh, in a blanket way. Now, there it's always marketed as well. We're only giving them the ability to do it and bring it back for an up or down. But the truth is what we're doing is we're giving the, and I'm a free trader, but you're giving them the ability to have silent deals, to have uh, secondary deals, and then to use trade agreements to then expand trade agreements further. And I think, I think without transparency, the House should say we can't give up any authority without us, us being fully engaged, and right now the House is locked out of it. The other half of it is really many of these things are truly treaties. And ACTA has not had a Senate day, and it isn't going to get a Senate day. So both bodies have a reason to say this is a bad way to do it. The executive branch is one elected official at the head and one person checking the obit every day to, uh, to see if he's got a job. I mean, come on, you know, it's, it, that's the nature of it. You have one person with all the power and a, another person waiting to see if he'll ever get any power. That's the entire elected part of that branch. And I know the president famously recently talked about the unelected judges, you know, the nine justices. But the fact is, most of the bureaucracy of the executive branch is completely unelected, unappointed uh, by, by anyone except the executive, and in many cases, unconfirmed. So do I trust the, uh, uh, the various trade uh, czars and, uh, and, and so on? No, I have no reason to trust them. Uh, because ultimately I had no input in their selection and, I ha and they owe me no answers and they usually give us no answers. So you were one of the motivating forces behind Keep the Web Open and, and that, that site really encompasses a lot of the things we've talked about. And Tony, already. you ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to go a lot further. And I'm sure there will be more to come. As, as you look forward, um, in addition to the issues that are wrapped up in SOPA and PIPA, uh, in terms of keeping the web open, what do you see as the big issues going forward in the next year two years as the next congressional section, session plays out? Tony, it's the easiest one to figure out. What you can tax, you can own. Government's taxing authority of the internet is going to be the next step. I think we all understand that if you want to be able to go to Best Buy and have them be there in a brick or mortar store, you're going to have to figure out how not to go there, look at something, and then order it on the internet and not pay sales tax. I think all of us understand there is some legitimate balancing that has to go on. But my biggest concern is, in the name of that essential balancing, we're going to see various forms of taxation, not just the U.S., but globally. If you look at, and, and I, I oversee the post office. I know you're, you all wanted to hear that here. Uh, but you know, the post office actually said with a straight face they wanted one penny per email and their problems were over. Okay. I mean, they really did. You know, without the post office, there'd be no mail. They really said that. Well, it's laughable now because it's sort of, first of all, they couldn't use that much money. Uh, I'd actually like to tax some of the people who send me email. Yeah. That, that might be well, if you had a penny on each spam, you could, really, you could really collect a lot of money. But the fact is that I think our biggest concern is to make sure that true taxing, meaning taking money, and regulation which taxes innovation are the two biggest threats. A law like SOPA, pretty much we can look at and we can have a real Donnybrook fight over. But the other two are much harder. The FCC and other regulatory agencies can regulate without really a lot of comment. And you can find burdens there. Additionally, taxation, it's always easy. You know, we're still paying for the Spanish-American War if you look at the tax on telephones. So bear in mind that these are the two biggest threats. The threat to innovation, which is much of it regulation, and the idea in the name of balancing budgets, you come up with creative taxes that could, in fact, stifle what would otherwise be good business models. Well, you mentioned the FCC, and a, a lot of people, including our director, Barbara Benshevik, believes that one of the key things to keeping the web open uh, is strong net neutrality rules. And the FCC has passed uh, neutrality rules, um, three basic principles. And you've come out fairly strongly against them. Um, the transparency rule, uh, the no blocking rule, the no unreasonable discrimination rule. I didn't think I thought I thought I came out relatively for I th them. Well, I, th I think well, you, you supported the bill to repeal the FCC regulations, didn't you? The the question is, should the FCC be making have that regulatory authority? Wait, well, they, well, they they passed those regulations and no, the well, question, they, they seized authority. The question is, did they ever have the authority to seize? 
because they seized the authority over entities they didn't previously have regulatory uh, authority over. So is, is the punchline that it should be Congress who passes whatever net neutrality rules we have? I think it's very dangerous to have, to essentially put the internet into the FCC. Uh, because now you're talking about not just cable, not just wireless, but, but all wired, uh, and, and even, even potentially private networks. So I'm much more of a libertarian on let's be a little careful. Now, there are some real questions that I think are fair. And I've, I've always said, if you have limited bandwidth, you have a right to charge what market will bear for that bandwidth. What you don't have a right to do is discriminate your product in preference over their products. So AT&T doesn't care. block Skype? Or in any way prioritize. You know, AT&T or any of the other carriers, uh, Comcast, it doesn't matter who it is, they would never really need to block because they could prioritize. On the other hand, and, and I'll close with this, let's understand, if I want my VOIP to have, have preference, I want it to have less latency, and I want to know that I'm not going to uh, 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 be my conversation. Oh, good. I'm glad somebody got that. <laughs> Otherwise, I was, you know, on the web, they're not going to get it till you explain it. But if I want to have that high quality, and that quality requires a preference, then the question is, should there be an inherent bar? Not should it be equal between my VoIP and your VoIP, which in the case of the cable companies, they all have those solutions. That, those kinds of decisions are good decisions to be made. And so am I in favor of net neutrality? Absolutely. Do I think it needs to be defined at least initially by legislation? And then if the authority is given to the FCC, that authority would be given discreetly? Yes. Do I think that, uh, quite frankly, the FCC seized authority and I question it? Yeah. So if, if we were to scrap the FCC rules and put the ball back in Congress's court, and, and you were the one who gets to shape whatever net neutrality legislation comes out of Congress, how would it differ from the rules that the FCC promulgated in 2010? Well, I think the, big, the biggest one, and we were talking about antitrust. If I can de determine the relevant market, then the debate is over. Congress needs to define that, that on a common carrier, you are, in fact, by definition, a monopoly automatically. And so you get monopolistic consideration. Even if you only have 2% market share, and even if somebody else has the 98%, on that carrier, you still have a, a monopolistic power. And you should be held to that standard of how you treat your competitive advantage. That's, that immediately defines <clears throat> the biggest question, which is my preferring my products over your products. Now, the idea that you charge more for preferential service and that you sell it, I've got to tell you, for everybody in this room, if I told you that we had two speeds of train going from Washington to New York and that one of them got there 16 minutes faster but cost 50 percent more, you'd say, well, okay, that's the Excella. And by the way, it's taken by a huge amount of people. OK, no problem. The difference is both exist. They're both fairly priced. And there's no intent to dissuade anyone from taking one or the other. We need to have the same sort of rules. So do I think that we should apply, if you will, from a Judiciary Committee standpoint, not from a Commerce Committee, the rules of what you can or can't do as a, an incumbent of some kind of common carrying? Yes. But do I think you have to do what the FCC's done? No. I, I don't think, I think what you do is you start blocking things where, and most of you have never been before the FCC and looking for a, a, a waiver or some way to do product, but they, they're, they're a, a body that gives those, those favors away. So you go to the FCC and you say, well, I know you have all these rules, but I've got this plan. So you spend your life begging the FCC for a permit to let you do what they're stopping. I think, again, that's over-regulation. It should be fairly clear. If you don't abuse your power, but you want to have two different train speeds, and you want to sell them, and you're not favoring yourself, but you're saying, you know, if, if and how many, how many of you have electric uh, where you can actually be shut off automatically by your carrier to prevent a blackout? It's a very common thing. Well, that's an example where the electric utility gives you a credit for being willing to be shut off on a hot day so the whole system doesn't go down. So, you do. Uh, yeah, you just shut off Southern California. That's good. Uh, 
Thanks, San Diego. Thanks you. Yeah, but, yeah, but Tony, that's that's. Yeah, but that but that's a good example though, where a lot of these rules were in place, and to a certain extent, I want the internet to and and the carriers to be able to come up with products. And as long as they meet certain principles, they shouldn't have to go begging to the FCC. So, so it sounds like if you if you break it into the three categories of FCC rules, there's transparency. Transparency, you'll find me totally for. And and we talked about no blocking, which it sounds like you mainly no outright about. blocking and and no obviously no slowing of services, unless that you've agreed to take a lower rate for if you will being slowed during high congestion. And that's in this classic example where I'd love to get a lower rate. To have you know to have some things, but when I when I find out I have 15 minutes to vote, that particular email I need to get right away because I don't want to get it 16 minutes later. So it sounds like you're focused on the third category, which is the unreasonable discrimination and how fast it moves. Right. And right. And as soon as you define all all public transfer of data, as soon as you define them as relevant market being potentially monopolistic. You define a whole set of rules that allow huge amounts of scrutiny, candidly, by the court that uh, you know you once belonged with. So what I'd like to do now is is open. Are you out of questions, Tony? I I no. I've got actually. I've You're got three, four, Tony. five pages. I could keep going. We could talk about privacy rules, but I want to give everybody here a chance to ask you questions and not just listen to my questions. So we have microphones. Please use them so we can get your voice recorded. Um, and come on up and ask whatever questions you have. Otherwise, you're going to have to keep listening to me. Now, I came in after Enron, but if you want to come up and ask the question, I'd love to hear it. Aspirations, okay. you know, qualities, values, etc. Of Stanford. So you're resigning University. for one minute. I'm here in my individual capacity. Um, you know, I'm old enough to remember that the reason we were told way back when in 1994 that it's going to be so great to go from commercial television to cable television because on commercial television you've got commercials, and when we pay, then we won't have any commercials. Well, you know, myself, I haven't watched TV for four years because it's just hopeless with commercials. And so, I mean, I, I don't get... I hope you don't get. try to watch public broadcasting because they're now hopeless with a different kind of commercial. Well, whatever. Uh, that's, that's teeny, teeny, tiny. Out of the 55 stations of cable, which is filled with commercials, public broadcasting is like this. And anyway, uh, I don't look at the slice. But I guess I just, uh, these hopeful dreams about ITC, ITC has its limitations. If you prove, uh, you know, a uh, patent uh, infringement, then that forecloses the entire vehicle, the entire innovation from being imported. I just think that we have to slice more thinly. And, um, you know, the idea is that everything that we've done in the past is great and has led to innovation. I'm not so sure. I mean. In terms of, you know, uh, the non-taxation of the internet, there are going to be huge issues around that. But for myself, Amazon had destroyed, and other people, Amazon has destroyed bookstores throughout the United States of America. There's no question. Uh, so I think we have to really think pretty crisply. And what I go back to again is the promise in 1994 that if we're going to switch now from from commercial TV to you know this other cable TV, and the thing about cable TV that's going to be so wonderful is that you pay, and then you don't have to watch commercials. Well, you know, I mean that that that's far you know away from anybody's experience. So I understand that you know I'm not denigrating the aspect of the workload and 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 what has to be drilled down. But I think just we want to be really, really, really careful. And I don't know how we can accomplish that in, in this political environment. Uh, well, so it's, that's my issue. I appreciate that. It, uh, uh, I am on HBO with Bill Maher once a season. He has no commercials, nor is he restrained in his language. So uh, uh, I will say that, uh, that not all cable has advertising. But I think your point at the very end, uh, ma'am, was very good, which is, 
if you're going to do legislation, do it as surgically and as small as possible so the unintended consequences are at least minimal and definable. And that probably is my message on open, which is it doesn't do very much. It only affects a very, it only has one tool and only affects uh, overseas entities. But our view is after we take care of those in this small bill, there may be more to do, but at least we're not combining apples, oranges, pomegranates, and tangerines and then trying to grow a common fruit. Yes, sir. Thank you. Fascinating. Uh, I'm Scott McLeod. I'm developing startup world university and school, like Wikipedia now in 284 languages with MIT OpenCourseWare. We'd like to be in all three to 8,000 languages. Question I have is how um, might such thing, looking abroad and at the benefits of the internet as a distributed um, sort of technology and the benefit of sharing ideas for innovation, um, how might um, either this openness principle be extended to um, define relationships in terms of openness on internets in other countries. How to engage countries which are closed down? How can you go the opposite way from SOPA and PIPA and open up other countries? And could World University and School be one way, offer a free school in a language or a free school in a country, online degrees, um, as a way to open and engage? Well, I'm going to comment on two, two things you said. You had a lot of great questions there. One of them is, I believe, and I know I'm sitting at one of the premier universities in the world, but I believe that basic college education could be taught 100% online and, like Linux, be open source. I believe people should be able to get a college degree for no money. That, in fact, the basic curriculum of college, enough good people should be able to develop a certifiable course structure that then could be automated in its lesson, automated in its testing, and at the end of the day you could get a legitimate degree without ever paying a penny. I think that's a doable, a doable uh, goal. Now, it's not going to, to do everything. It's not going to put great universities out of, uh, out of business. It certainly isn't going to do fundamental research. But it certainly would allow the masses to not build up a $100,000, $150,000 bill that they're paying off. You understand there's more than a trillion dollars worth of college debt. There's more college debt right now in America than there is credit card debt. And if university costs keep going the way they are, it's going to be unsustainable. So I'm totally in your camp. The internet could, in fact, provide that. And like Wikipedia, it could be done and credentialed for such a de minimis amount of money that a few foundation uh, uh, gifts could do it, particularly if it was, in fact, uh, a, non, a complete nonprofit. Switching to your other point, collaboration over the internet begs the whole question of will the internet be a free trade zone from its inception? Today, my communication, even if in fact I'm answering a question that is monetized in another country, is currently untaxed. So if somebody says, what about this, and I give an answer, and they monetize it in another country, today there's no taxing curriculum either direction. I can get, I can get that information from another country, I can send it to another country, and it's only, monet it's only taxed where and if it's monetized. That kind of free trade zone has to continue to exist. And that's where governments are going to say, but look, this guy is, is, is using somebody else's wealth and, and it's not being taxed. And we would normally tax that, so how do, we, how do we get around it? That's where we have to push back and say, you can get conventional tax, but when you try to tax that conduit, you're gonna stifle the internet. And so that would be another example where I think that you should look for people wanting to, tra to tax transactions other than the legitimate entity. I mean, if you sell something and it has sales tax and it's delivered in San Diego, pay 8% sales tax. But there should be no additional tax, and that's where governments are trying to find revenue, and they're looking to the internet. Wait, yes, but actually, before we go to James, I just want to jump in with, with yes. one question, because we mentioned universities, and we mentioned access to knowledge. So I have to ask you about the Research Works Act. This is a bill that you co-sponsored that would prohibit open access mandates for federally funded research. A lot of people right. like to say that if research is federally funded, it has to be freely accessible to everybody, free of any restrictions, whether they're copyright, uh, IP, or other restrictions on the fruits of that research that the taxpayers paid for. Well, so why, why, why prohibit that open access mandate? Tony, it's a great question. I'll be brief. The data that's paid for by the government is being delivered to the government. It was actually only, it was much more narrow, it was only on, and by the way, when you talk about making a mistake, write this one down as one of my mistakes. 
Carolyn Maloney of New York, a, de a Democrat from New York who serves on a committee with me, we said, oh, well, let's, let's look at the NIH and these other groups, which were not literally stripping, but over time they were getting down to zero to where they were stripping your research paper, your actual published paper, so that there was no period of exclusivity, so you couldn't go to the New England Journal of Medicine or some other uh, group and say, I'd like you to publish this, and that entity would have a period of time to publish it in the ordinary course of copyright. Uh, and we said, well, you know, some, some parts of government give you a period, others don't, they're reducing it. So we thought that we would strip them of the arbitrary ability. Now that didn't mean they, it didn't change the fact they could still write in the contract that a paper was owed and that paper would belong to the government. What it meant was they weren't able to simply arbitrarily take, if you will, a published work and say, well, that's the fruit. Uh, it was an abysmal failure. We, uh, we discovered that it was a bridge that was hard to cross and hard to understand. But let's understand, everybody in this room who graduates and wants to make a living realizes that copyright is a factor. And that if you, if you and I'm a government guy, so yeah, I want the government to get what it's paid for. But we understand the government is terrible at monetizing what it's paid for, and in this case, we were probably reducing, and I think we still are reducing the quality of these papers. Because when a contract says, well, we want you to publish a paper at the end of it all, where's your incentive, once you've got the grant, to make it really good? Tenure. <laughs> you have no idea how disconnected those two are. You only have, you only have to publish. You do not have to publish that well. But uh, in the case of this research, our view was that, that some period of not the full copy, not 90, 75 years plus the life of the author, but a year or two was a more reasonable period to be worked out. Uh, having said that, remember, the data, the underlying data is immediately available. This was one of those where Carolyn Maloney and I, on a bipartisan basis, went into something we didn't fully understand. We quickly, a little bit like Madison, we quickly got input and we pulled the bill. So the bill's not going anywhere. We're still looking at, at how do you find the right balance because I want the government to get what it's paid for and I want it to make it available to the public. Uh, in some cases, I want them to monetize it because remember, the NIH's work often and, and other uh, paid for, often is still monetized by somebody who gets it for free. And that becomes the other part of it is, if we, if, we, if we take it from somebody we've paid, we put it on the web, and then somebody else monetizes it because it's still gobbledygook when the government puts it out, then the question is, who owns that copyright? So all of that is more complex, and it'll take me at least a couple more years before I'll look at another bill. We'll watch Madison. Yes, sir. Thanks for joining us today, Congressman. Uh, I'm wondering if you viewed the SOPA blackout as a shift in the tech industry's interest in getting involved in politics and also how you view the balance of power between Silicon Valley and Hollywood today and also going forward. There is a balance today and there wasn't before. Uh, and that's a good thing uh, because I think there has to be content providers are not just people who make movies and, and, and musicians. and. People up here are just as interested in intellectual property protection, but not necessarily the bill that was offered very narrowly uh, by the recording artist and the Motion Picture Association. That's a good thing. How did I view the blackout? There, I, I grew up in an era in which Martin Luther King was going on hunger strikes. He was doing nonviolent marches. Uh, before that, Gandhi was starving himself to death. The willing to deny, willingness to deny your own best interest because it's so important that you want to make a point by denying yourself is a absolutely phenomenal tool. It shouldn't be used every day, but in this case it was a good use. Wikipedia, their foundation board, and it took a little while, but their foundation board decided that it was in their long-term best interest to shut off. Not just to put a black label, but to shut off. Google was willing to take the possibility of some very bad uh, press hits and, and even a, a stockholder value by doing something for a day. And, and 6,998 more companies did the same thing. So I think a little bit like a hunger strike uh, or, uh, or a nonviolent protest, a, a point was made by people who cared enough to deny themselves something. They weren't just showing off. And I think it said to the Motion Picture Association, come and negotiate and you'll get results in all likelihood. And, and I certainly would be championing that they get results. 
but don't assume you can bully people who are willing to shut off their own sites. Yes, sir. First, thank you for your work on, on, on helping stop SOPA and come up with a better alternative. But a related question, I mean, we saw this situation where we have a prepackaged, created in the dark MPAA slash RIA bill, which sort of all of a sudden, by the time anybody looks up, is the freight train you discussed. Right. And you have people having to do hunger strikes in order to derail it. It's not the first time we've seen it. We saw it years ago with the Induce Act. It was the same kind of thing. We looked up one day and went, oh my god, this is about to pass. Where did this come from? And people had to mobilize like heroic efforts to sort of step in front of the train. How do we change the, and I, you know, this is an area that I pay attention to. I'm sure it's the same in many other areas. I'm sure there are, you know, oil bills that come in, hit the floor without anybody having read them or, you know, health care or, you know, veterans rights or in any area. How do we, ch how do we change the system so we don't get these carried by lobbyists hitting the floor, oh my God, it's almost too late, bills that require people to step in front of trains and instead get a more rational process or it's said just the way it is? No, it's, it is the way it's been. Uh, part of the way you do it is rulemaking. Uh, part of it is, is, in fact, transparency. We can make all the rules about thou shalt not, but unless there's enough transparency for somebody to say, ah, but you are, you're not going to reach that. Uh, I have a bill, is kind of how congressmen say I was in this small off-off Broadway production. Uh, that just sorry, that's what comes to mind when somebody keeps wanting to say I have a bill. But I have a bill called the Data Act. Now that is a bill that has no enemies and I have not yet been able to get passed. And the reason is it doesn't have any enemies, but it has universities who are concerned that if they have to disclose how they spent all the money they received from the government in grants, it might hurt them. And, and you'd be amazed how many grant recipients do not want to actually show what they did with the grant money, because as it turns out, universities are famous for getting grants and then often spending it slightly differently. And there's not a lot of, you know, yeah, well, that's close enough. There's not a lot of follow-up. It's sort of like a GSA convention in, uh, in, in Las Vegas. Uh, you know, we, we're there to do research, but it, we did have a good time. The fact is, the Data Act requires reporting similar to the Stimulus Act. And, and for those who are surprised I'm talking well of the Stimulus Act, I voted against it. It was $800 billion poorly thought out, but it was well accounted for. We know where it was misspent. And, <laughs> uh, and we're tr the Data Act tries, tries to have the same kind of recipient reporting that was in, you know, one of the reasons you know about Solenda and all these other things is there was a very good reporting system. And so it, it allows us to forensically find out more about where mistakes were made or money was misspent. So the, the real answer is to get transparency, we need to get, if you will, database or data integrity that has identifiable, meta, identifiable metadata so that you know that this to use my old, uh, you know, sort of spreadsheet thinking, that this cell and this cell are actually the same cell. They've got to have the equivalent of what we used to think of as headers. And so XBRL and, and other metadata-rich, disciplined software uh, formats can give us that. And that's what we're trying to feed into everything. We've got the FDIC doing it, uh, uh, the... Uh, I'm trying to think of all the other agencies, the SEC. A lot of financial organizations have adopted this. What we need to do is we need to get it in all government spending so that when you look at what's happening at the Department of Agriculture, who gives out food stamps, and at Health and Human Services, who's dealing with, I don't know, Section 8 housing or whatever, you suddenly realize, well, if you've got a fraud perpetrated in one, you ought to be able to trace it to the other. Well, today, you can't even identify that it's the same entity in two different places or that they have the same board of directors but different names. So where I'm looking at fraud, the same information is there. Congress has to be more transparent. Uh, we want to see every bill, the moment it's, it's put in, online. But more importantly, we want to see amendments as they're actually entered in markups put online so that you know three hours or four hours before a markup starts, you know what the authors of the amendments know because they printed them the type night before. And if you do, you can empower the other side by offering amendments to those amendments or comments, you can empower people to know what they didn't know. 
So all of that will help. Nothing is perfect, but if we did all of that, we'd all be looking for the next step of improvement rather than sitting here saying that ceiling is so high to get transparency and, and accountability. Well, what about the, the role of money in politics? I mean, how much is that part of the problem that's causing people to have to jump in front of these trains? Because that's, that's something that's been talked about a lot lately. And now, it's lately? gotten worse. <laughs> uh, well, see, now that's an opinion. You're the moderator, aren't you? I'm entitled to an opinion here or there. Okay, well, you can step up the there, microphone let's, let's and put it tell this me way. for a minute. Empirically, there's probably a lot more money in politics pouring through Congress than there was, say, 15 years ago. How many, Is that part of the problem? How many, I'm going to give a little quick lesson, but how many people know who Andrew Jackson was? <laughs> okay, now what are the two most famous things for the founder of the Democratic Party, Andrew Jackson? What are the two best things he's known for? He, the Trail of Tears, in violation of the Supreme Court, he marched Indians to their death in mass numbers in violation of a Supreme Court ruling, made that decision. The second thing is he sold every cabinet position outright during his election, told people how much it would cost to get a position, and then delivered. He was an honest politician. He delivered on the money he got. Now, we could go to Abraham Lincoln, the founder of the Republican Party, and start talking about locking up a judge or denying uh, the delivery of, of mail if it included things which he thought were seditious because they disagreed with him. Presidents have done this kind of thing for a long time. Politicians have been part of it. The most important thing is transparency. Right now, we don't have any transparency into what unions do with your money if you're a union employee. We just don't. And by the way, we have no idea what the super PACs are doing, or very little. So do we have a right as voters to know where money's, the source of money is? Yes. Do we have the right to cut off the money? The Supreme Court already said no, and I think the Supreme Court was right. I didn't think they were. I didn't think they were right when they uh, when they Shays Meehan or, or McCain Feingold when they ruled differently. But they ruled. The fact is, the case we have now is money is free speech. The question is, is free speech to be said out loud, or is it to be whispered behind closed doors? My view is the court has never said that you can't have transparency as to the source of money, and if we have full transparency of the source of money. The, and, and by the way, crimes for trying to hide it, we're going to get most of the way there. Yes, sir. Okay. I, I have a question about another internet policy issue. Um, so Richard Clark, right back to the internet. Richard Clark wrote an op-ed this last week that can be summarized as the Chinese are taking all, our, all of our IP over the internet, the government needs more police power to stop this, and Obama is not doing anything because he's afraid of the same people that stopped SOPA and PIPA. Um, can you talk the about Chinese stop? So <laughs> no, 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 no. The... Darn. <laughs> uh, can you talk about whether what sort of activities around more police control of the internet? Whether there's anything like that coming up, or sort of what what the feeling is in, in Congress about that? Well, I'll answer the question just a little long-winded. I have uh, I have 11 Native American tribes in my district. Now they're they're sovereign tribes under the Constitution. They're sovereigns. But they're also completely under U.S. control. So if a Native American tribe was stealing secrets on the internet, we'd send federal marshals in there and we'd say, we appreciate your sovereignty, you're under arrest. <laughs> the, uh, the, the problem with China or Russia or France or Israel, which are our biggest pirates, and I used all four because two of them we know are bad guys, two of them were wondering why they're such big pirates is, they're sovereigns. And they have to be dealt with by Secretary Clinton. They have to be dealt with in international policy. And I think we should be brutally honest, and we should be willing to go to very provocative activities, both at the WTO, because there are signatures, but also uh, uh, unilaterally, if necessary, to make the point that commercial piracy, I'm specifically talking about commercial piracy, has to stop, that if a country is not willing to enforce against individual pirates, in the case of China and Russia, sometimes they're behind military bases, so they're not so individual. If they're not willing to do it, then we'll take action. And the best example, I said it'd be long-winded, the end of it is, look, 
I fought and successfully along with Tom Lantos, who's passed away but used to represent an area near here, we fought to stop Russia from getting into WTO because we'd already seen that China got into WTO and then did something I can't do with a video camera in front of me uh, and went backwards on everything. Uh, we're about to put Russia in the WTO. I mean, they've set everything up, they've cleared it, and I think it's the wrong message. I think that you have to find ways to not put them in the tent so they say, now I'm in the tent. We've got to be stronger against uh, these international entities. I don't think police action is the answer. I think you, you, you deal with them much more the way we're dealing with Iran. You up the ante and make it painful to, uh, to allow your people or your government itself to steal. You know, Microsoft's largest customer is China. Their smallest revenue is China. Yes, sir. Yeah, along the, uh, that line, uh, Congressman, this is the first time I'm actually talking to one. I become a citizen in the U.S. So well, congratulations. Very, appreciated this opportunity. But um, you're probably you know, one of only five percent that swore allegiance to this country in the room. You, know. <laughs> <laughs> you think about it. If you're I, born you know, here, you don't have to do it. If you, you know, want to become I, a citizen, you I do. I grew up in the in the Philippines. Went through the Marcos regime and the dictatorship. Did you Trust get any me, this shoes? Is, this is the best, you know. Was you that again? You didn't get a single pair of shoes out of that whole regime. No, did you? fortunately, no. I was still pretty young. Anyway, um, during my my trips to Asia Pacific, I've been to Hong Kong, Shanghai, Manila, and Taiwan. Well, you know, walking down in the shopping center, I get hit on so many times by peddlers. For like, for example, a DVD will have twelve, eight to twelve American movies in it, and obviously they're pirated. And they're and, not high def at that. And then, uh, obviously, and also, you go in through some of these shopping malls. You also get hit on for operating systems, whether that's a Mac or or uh, Microsoft software, or Office, etc. I'm just thinking, you know, with these two current bills going on uh, in our in Congress, I just think the the technology with Hollywood and Silicon Valley, they can probably squash the piracy themselves. I just feel like the, these two bills potentially could limit their creativity in solving the piracy issue. I think they had a technology, in my opinion, today, they can squash this literally if they wanted to, but if the government comes in, you know, what's going on there? I think it's going to limit their creativity to, to destroy piracy using technology. And one more note, you know, and I had a conversation with one of the attendees here. I mean, we got China right now. They're in the black. They're a hybrid socialist communist country, but we're in the red for $16 trillion. We let this we let this thing happen to ourselves. I mean, we literally let this technology, intellectual property, go out freely to the world. And I think now these guys are all looking for the government to solve the problem. Where really, I think, in my opinion, they caused this problem for not, you know, controlling the technology they're releasing out there by way of programming. So, well, you know, uh, Manuel, you have a good point. We we did pass a law a number of years ago that made it a crime to take your camcorder in and record right off the screen. And that was only necessary because it was a circumvention that they were somewhat without a power to stop. Uh, and so, you know, in some cases, we have a reason to help these, these entities. I certainly think that some technologies would stop. But at some point, if you ignore the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, you reverse engineer and you crack whatever encryption they have on their, on their software for, let's just say, you know, a movie, uh, there still has to be some sort of help from us. I've said to the motion picture associations, you know, at least you can, you can embed more information in so that we have some ability to trace it, which is helpful, because the Attorney General, the Justice Department is perfectly happy if they have a serial number effectively to trace back to the source. But if they don't have a serial number, then they really only trace back to the seller. And that, that means that they're getting the little fish, they're never getting the source. I think your point, though, is good, that innovation by the recording art <coughs> became the willingness to put online and sell to iTunes, or in the case of the movies, Netflix. Uh, that only came when they began realizing that they were losing money because they didn't even offer a quick and easy delivery system. And today, Netflix is, is pushing for SOPA-type legislation, because at least they have a business model that offers you very quick, very easy delivery, 
and yet it's being circumvented by somebody who offers you the same quick and easy but cheaper because they start off with no cost. So I think there's a middle ground there. I, I agree with you, obviously, that SOPA wasn't the middle ground. But I do think that in some cases we have to help all content providers, but we have to help them equally, whether it's a pirated copy of uh, Microsoft Office or it's a pirated movie, we have to deal with it in the same way. And that's why, again, I think OPA, Open at least starts that dialogue with one solution for one part of the problem. Yeah, and talking some of, some of the peddlers quietly, I mean, a lot of it is really the government is not, like for example, in, in Shanghai, they don't care because they're making because the government's going to be collecting on them, and they can obviously foreclose on them real quick, not a problem. And that's what's been going on in, in Asia, and that's why I think it's going to be a problem unless you know you deal with the highest level of their government. This thing is not going to stop. Maybe. Exactly, and, and that government to government is the critical element. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, my question is about SOPA. Um, I don't really understand Hollywood's strategy. I was hoping you could shed some light on it. Uh, so they have these outlandish uh, estimates of the cost of piracy, which most people agree are way out of line with what it actually costs them. Uh, they spend all their political capital, virtually, and all their credibility on this legislation which doesn't pass and also quite possibly might not have helped very much. Uh, they also invest enormous technical effort into DRM and other digital locks, which are both immensely annoying and are really ineffective since they pretty much force people towards piracy rather than away from it. Um, all I can think is that they're pursuing a strategy of getting in the way of format shifting so that people are forced to uh, buy the same content over and over again. Other, the other alternative is that they're simply irrational. So I was wondering which of those two, or, or if it's a third, <laughs> you think that you think they're well, I think your one comment on format shifting Clearly, the content providers believe that there's no such thing as fair use. That, uh, that in fact, the ability to, uh, to take my CD and put it on my iPod uh, should, in fact, be another piece of revenue. And since I also have an iPad, another piece. Uh, and since I have a computer at home that I ripped it from, that's another piece. Uh, you know, I've, I've had all the what we think of as fair uses uh, defined as, oh, those aren't fair uses, which begs the whole question of when is the Judiciary Committee of the House and the Senate going to say, look, we're going to define some limits to what you can or can't do? And the answer is, I don't know when we're going to do it, but it's too late because we've already done it. We've already defined that source material, I'm not going to be denied the ability to move it from place to place. And even uh, iTunes now has reached a point of realizing that they have to look at the content providers and say, I have to deliver this product. I have to deliver something where when the iPod is lost, it can be replaced from online. And the content producers, because this is such a large customer, have said, yes, of course. That's the beginning of a realization that you want to buy your content, you want to own it, and if you don't necessarily want to give it to 800 people because that would be stealing, but you certainly want to have an unlimited use. And I, and I think we're heading toward that. But the, back to the Motion Picture, the Motion Picture Association was and Chris Dodd were representing the part of the cup that it sloshed out. And it was a lot of coffee sloshed out on the saucer and onto the table. They weren't looking and saying, how do we keep what's in here, in here, and build it? And when they start looking at that of, well, wait a second, how do we make our product better, uh, sell it 100 new, new ideas and new ways, and oh, by the way, we need some protection from people just ripping us off, then we have a better ability to work with them. But you're right. Right now, they don't, they're not looking at their business model. They're just looking at the part that splashed out and blaming somebody for it and putting a high price on it. I mean, very quickly, do you, do you think they actually believe their estimates, their published estimates of how much piracy costs? Well, I'm, in, I'm from Washington, and we never call anyone a liar. We, uh, <laughs> what we try to say is perhaps there's an absence of reality in your fact. Uh, <laughs> it, in the extreme case, we'll say he could be disingenuous or misinformed, and I won't speculate on which. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I wanted to pick and up. And that on could apply to me, too. I've, I've been accused of those, too. 
I wanted to pick up on something you said about uh, the, the SOPA and the PIPA debate that these pieces of legislation were coming and were being supported by uh, congresspersons who had no idea what was in the In bill. the case of SOPA, PIPA was so around a lot longer, had been voted, and it didn't even have buyer's remorse after it was voted out. So there, and there were some changes. Uh, but I think the senators didn't focus on it as much as eventually the House did. And I, I want to talk about that problem in general, the idea that the, uh, that the our representatives don't actually know what's in the bills that that are that, and they don't understand the problem. We saw it in the hearings where they were saying, "I'm not a geek. I don't know. I don't know how the internet works." And to me, it seems. Wait a like second. I had a couple of guys in my committee who said, were proud to be geeks. Sure. Blake Farenholt was was a, a software designer and a geek. But yes, we had a very few that were willing to uh, to stand up to that. And <laughs> I, I, I wonder, I, to me it seems like, I wonder how much of that actually also plays into the fact of money and politics and how much time representatives spend uh, fundraising and uh, you know focusing on, on that as part of, as a bigger chunk of the job as opposed to uh, learning what are in these bills, what is good for, for the public in general, what are the pluses and minuses, and, and then also, if you could kind of touch on how, that, how your idea of the open bills and, and, and the Madison project kind of shifts that burden back to the public, for the public to be the people that are also completely on top of what is in these bills and making sure that their elected representatives have learned about it. And so to me, it seems like the uh, fundraise, all of that kind of fits together and creates a big problem. Fundraising gets a bad rap. I was a self-funder. Uh, in an unsuccessful Senate race, uh, seven out of every eight dollars came out of my, my own pocket. In a House race, half of the money came out of my own pocket. Since that time, uh, I've, I've raised all the money and then, and then quite a bit for all my elections and helped others. What people miss about self-funding, non-funding, public funding versus having to reach out and get money from others, there's nothing more equalizing than when you have to ask for money. So don't, don't assume that, money, that asking for money is a bad thing. Asking for money and asking for votes are part of the reason that, that elected officials do a different job and often do it with more humility than bureaucrats who you don't know their name and they're not going to lose their civil service job. So if I had to choose between the two, I'll take, I'll take somebody who has to grovel for dollars and, uh, and grovel for votes. When I suggest that open brings accountability, first of all, there's 750 or so, I call it 700,000 Americans for every one member of the House. I'm not suggesting that 700,000 people in my district are going to care about all my legislation. I only need a fraction of 1% to get involved with any piece of legislation, and we have thousands of people. And they're opt-in. But they're not the same opt-ins that are probably writing checks to get done what they want. So it's a different group, and it's a group that hopefully can affect voters. And you know, the reason that SOPA and PIPA turned on a dime was that every member either, either got religion or, the, uh, or their fundraiser and their political advisor told them they were going to get religion in the next election. <laughs> and that latter one of Orrin Hatch, for example, uh, Orrin Hatch started off generally a PIPA guy. He's up for election in November. He turned and became one of our, our pro advocates. And there were a number of those. Now, Orrin's a very smart guy, so I give him credit that once he focused on it, he also knew it was a bad bill. But at the same time, our best supporters were people who were looking and saying, this could cost me my next election. And I had a couple of people who will remain nameless who called me up and said, stop beating on me. I've got a tough election. And my answer is, come to my side and you'll have an easier election. <laughs> I just want to tell her, we have time for one, maybe two questions, because we have to wrap up. By Lightning here. round, quick question, okay. quick answer. Um, question goes to the rationale behind SOPA and OPEN as well, all these acts. Um, do we have uh, the good data showing that um, the kind, particular kinds of piracy that are um, targeted by these acts is actually going on? Um, most of the data that deals with piracy comes, of course, from the RA and the MPAA, uh, the purveyors of the $8 billion. We, we've got good data that shows that it only takes uh, less than 20 sites to get rid of 
the old 2080, mm. 70 plus percent of all piracy, that you're looking at a very few doing most of it, and that if you targeted them, you could dramatically reduce the losses. That's from the Motion Picture Association's agreed data. Yes, sir. I had a long walk uh, from the uh, lecture I listened to on the Habsburgs in the 19th century over to the law school. And on the way, I listened to my iPod. I listened to Larry Arn. The, At Hillsdale. The Fort guy who runs Fairmont. Hillsdale College. And he talked about the Constitution. And he told us how simple it was and how the administrative state has become the fourth branch. Is that from his uh, Constitution 101 online? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I refer all of you. That's an example of something you can get for free that is really cool. I agree. Um, so all of this that we've been discussing today is the administrative state. Is there a way to get rid of some of this overhead, this garbage? I support the uh, Pacific Legal Foundation in their battles against uh, the EPA and land use regulations. That's one question. My second question has to do with uh, Chris Dodd. I remember Chris Dodd from the secretary, from the waitress sandwich and countrywide. How could a corrupt person, as corrupt as he is, be selected by the Motion Picture Association to represent them? That's a, that's a longer answer than I have time for. Uh, uh, well, first of all, later this next month, I'll come out with a complete report on the countrywide scandal that'll focus on, from my committee, that'll focus on Angela Mozillo and countrywide and how they were able to use dollars that are completely opaque, basically dollars to refinance your house, dollars to uh, waive various fees, and they were able to use it to gain friends, Chris Dodd being one of the known friends, but there were countless ones you would never, you'd never even know. There was one person who had about a dozen refinances. This is a Senate staffer, a dozen refinances, and never paid a single closing cost, zero. So you can imagine how often if the interest rate went down, you would refinance your home if it cost you zero. Uh, certainly became a friend of Angelo. So, uh, Look, the, the Constitution was written to tell people that they had power and the government had a limited defined power. If over two centuries we have allowed the administrative state, we've allowed that power to slip away from the American people and to slip toward our government, the Constitution envisioned that nothing happened quickly. So in my time, if I can start it moving the other direction or stop it from going that direction, that's all you can expect. It's up to our children and grandchildren to pull it back over time. I would tell anyone, if you want a revolution, you've come to the wrong country. This is a country where when we talk revolution, we're really talking evolution. We are slow to make changes. What's called Obamacare is a bold move, and the court's considering whether or not it's too bold and whether or not it's constitutional. And I commend them on it. No matter what their result is, I don't think I can change the world because our, our America was designed to change slowly. And Larry Arm would tell you that in spite of how much he thinks we've lost original intent, that he wouldn't want it to go back overnight. He'd want it to go back by a process with buy-in from the American people. And that's, that's what I'm here tonight to do, is to talk about buy-in from the American people. Yes, sir. And you get the closing question. Oh, especially if I like it. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Well, let me just say, um, I, you and I probably differ on a great number of things, and uh, but I listen. My wife's over here. If you want to know about a great number of things being disagreed on. <laughs> but listening, listening to you tonight, and uh, especially the bipartisanship that went into um, a lot of these issues, and to what I think has been a very good outcome, at least thus far, um, I think that there's a, a great deal of uh, desire in the country from people to see more bipartisan cooperation, not only in this area, but in other areas, and you know, less talk about wars on religion and wars on women, especially when there's real wars actually going on. And I just would uh, ask what you can do to uh, you know, take the 
commendable bipartisanship that is seen here and expanded to other areas in government? Well, first of all, I've, I've had the, uh, the opportunity to visit our folks in theater every year since I've been in Congress, uh, because I came into Congress just in time to, uh, literally, I was in Bahrain when we began bombing Afghanistan. Uh, I'd, have, I'd have been somewhere else, but that's where they made us stay until the bombing uh, was over. Uh, there's an old Irish toast, you know, here's to me, here's to you, here's to you, here's to me, may we never disagree, if we do, well, hell with you, here's to me. Uh, uh, I think it's Irish, I, I was told it by the late Henry Hyde. Bipartisan behavior, including the fight against SOPA and PIPA, is here's to you, here's to me, may we never disagree, and in this case we don't, so let's work together. The most you can expect from Congress or from the President and Congress is if we agree, we should be able to work and work together and work productively. And if we disagree, we should be able to do so in a way that does not taint the ability to work together later when we do agree or can agree. So do I think, and I was having a great time with, with these two, uh, that's why they're sitting together, I bruise them. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I, you know I, I said, look, you want to talk about war, let's talk about war, and you know, the war, the, you know, the war on religion, uh, to see you know, if you scratch what would happen. Sometimes provocative words are perfectly good. They focus people on this. You know, the President, President uh, Bush said the war on terror. The interesting thing is President Obama has not eliminated the word war on terror, that phrase. Uh, when he took over. As a matter of fact, he hasn't eliminated any of the policies. So did President Obama disagree with President Bush? Yes, very famously on a host of issues. When he got the job and he realized that some of the things he disagreed with he was going to have to do because when he saw everything, he did it. That's, that's part of our system. Leave the door open for the change that sometimes happens. You're going to do things and you're going to be wrong. So when I joked earlier about you know, you know, basically, you, the worst you can call someone is, is disingenuous or, or mistaken, because you want to be careful not to outright call people things which hurt the ability to work with them later. That's probably the most you're going to get out of Washington. And I've been there for almost 12 years. I, I, didn't, I intended on being there for maybe two or four. Uh, my wife and I were in electronics, and we were going to go back into business. But the one thing I've learned is, if you disagree, do it. We, we disagreed, Jason Chaffetz and I, and I'll close with this, uh, and Paulus and the rest of us, when we were fighting SOPA, we presented one after another dilatory amendments. Our amendments were designed to force debate and time to where the other side got tired of hearing us tell us, telling them how wrong they were and how embarrassing they should, embarrassed they should be over this bad legislation. And we endlessly drove a few points home, including particularly uh, you know, the uh, DNS blocking. Now we did so not because we were gonna change the vote. We were gonna lose that vote. We did so because we had to run out the clock so we could get more time, so more people understood that we had to change a lot of votes. If we'd had a, if we'd had a vote that day on a bipartisan basis, we would have lost. So sometimes you fight even when you have to be pretty tough. And I don't have a single enemy on judiciary. Uh, we had a great fight, and at the end of it all, people respected the fact that we stood up for principle. Lamar Smith and I will have a hard time having the same relationship we had before I brought down a bill that he had invested a lot in. But at the same time, I'm ready to work with him the next day, and he knows it, and we're willing to, we're willing to do that. That's the most you get out of it. And, and if any of you get involved in government, uh, I'd suggest that that's the most important thing. Never burn the bridge on a future relationship with anybody unless they are inherently, truly dishonest and corrupt. Burn a bridge of somebody who's a bought politician, of course. But unless somebody is truly corrupt and you want to burn a bridge with them forever, bear in mind that the next day you may be working with, with Democrats on SOPA and PIPA who suddenly become your best friends. I mean, in the Senate, it was, to be honest, our best friends were Democrats early on. The Republicans came late. Well, in the House, it was mostly Republicans, but our fiercest enemy was the chairman who was a Republican. So uh, maybe a closing on this note is a good one. The business of politics is the business of people. We represent you as people. 
Don't ever try to take the humanity completely out of politics because the humanity is what you bring to us and it's what we bring to the process. People ask me why we don't have uh, you know, online voting, why we all go to the same well of the same place. And the answer is because if you take the human element out of it, we'd all be voting the same way and never changing our mind. And that would not make for a good country. Thank you very much. Everybody, please join me in thanking the